Okay, thank you very much for introducing me uh, and the actual talk. So uh, please be aware that this uh, session was marked as an advanced. The red color was uh, a warning. So <laughs> it's a 4 p.m. Great respect from my side to you that you made it. Uh, but just to be clear, I'll really keep explanations to introduction to BDD itself minimum. So I assume that you either heard about it, saw something, or you practice it. So that's that kind of talk. Um, out of curiosity, who uses or used or saw BDD in the past? Well, actually, I guess if my math is right, around 30%. So it's not that bad. And the rest of you, well, not to say I'm sorry, but the second half of the talk should be uh, more practical to you, even if you don't uh, like practically uh, use BDD. Okay. So, but also for you, a very short introduction. Um, BDD is like a technique, uh, comes with a lot of libraries that let you describe the systems in uh, this language called Gherkin, where at the top you name the feature and you have scenarios. And we'll be talking about uh, examples in a system of subscription management, something like you can, uh, Netflix is sold in that model, or Amazon Prime, and many other products, uh, very popular these days because uh, it uh, makes up for the perfect customers who pay and don't use the service, yeah, because you always forget to cancel the subscription. Um, yeah, so you have a scenario. Uh, it's described in a several steps, like first given a user with expired free trial, when a user purchases monthly subscription, then purchase is confirmed, and the account is upgraded to monthly subscription. And that way you describe how the system should behave, so to speak. And that's uh, later mapped to code. That's why we need this fancy language, because it not only aims to be readable by human, but also parsable by computers. So it kind of serves both. And since we're in Python world, there are a couple of libraries uh, to do that. Python's BDD, it's fork Python's BDNG, or behave. Um, but I must admit to you to something. I tricked you a bit, because this talk was submitted to testing. Uh, to testing uh, path, uh, and also often BDD is sold, so to speak, with testing techniques, while the reality is it's not about testing at all. It's only a byproduct that you get your automated verification, but BDD has a completely different goal, which I will shortly uncover. Uh, but you know, that's uh, how marketing in general works, and there comes complexity of the reality, and this is a lovely city of which in Poland I came to you from. Um, yeah, so my name is Sebastian Buczynski. I work as a trainer consultant in Bottega IT Minds. I'm also tech lead at Sauce Labs, not to lose touch with reality. Everything I say to you today, this is something I use, not something I invented, you know, between one training or another. This is uh, treated as a lessons learned mostly. And I have a little mission of uh, evangelizing software engineering in Python because, you know, many stuff that we like talk or rediscover in Python has al already been solved in other programming languages. Maybe we just need to adapt. We don't really have to uh, go through all the, uh, all the bad experiences. And in my spare time, I experiment with coffee a bit. So going back to BDD, let's break it down. And B stands for behavior. Um, and we really need to first define what it actually is. And the simple definition I have is whatever is visible on the outside of the system or whatever the scope uh, you're testing. Uh, if you guys are looking for some uh, empty seats there are on, the, on the, my left side on your right uh, at the front. And uh, an example of a behavior would be simply stating something that a user can see, maybe on another screen, maybe directly after direction, maybe in some report or whatever. Uh, so a classic example would be uh, how do we spec a registration feature with username and password? And some people uh, like tested via database. This is not the behavior because user cannot look into database unless they can, but <laughs> it's a different problem. Um, so a visible behavior a user can do after registration is to log in with that username and password. So that's how we like specify behavior, what the user can do, how they can see. Other auxiliary questions are how it affects other features. Uh, is there something new action available to the user? Or maybe there's something they cannot uh, do anymore. So in case of feature for a banning, let's say a uh, login pattern is banned, the scenario, given uh, bus asterisk is banned, whenever user registers as bus astral, which 
kind of fits the pattern. Then registration attempt is rejected, so they can see that they, hey, this failed. And as a result, Bazastra cannot log in. So everything like, is visible from the outside of the system. And what's not a behavior? Definitely not assertions about uh, records stored in the database, because it's not. It may be under some circumstances helpful to check this, but it's definitely not behavior. And uh, another uh, uh, bad habit uh, that happens when we uh, try to test behaviors, not implementation, is over so-called over-specification. I will show you an example without explaining it a lot, it would be easier. So at the top, let's say like you fetch your users from external system. And I assume that you use mocks or have used them in the past. So at the top, like uh, you set whatever should be returned from this external system mock. But at the bottom, let's say you have two assertions. First one is about response. And let's say you can uh, deduct from it that the user data is there. And then you actually want to be extra secure, extra sure, and uh, double check the smog. You don't really have to. Mm, if it won only one. <laughs> but yeah, this is a simplified code. Definitely, it's not working. Um, yeah, so other two, uh, two things not to do when checking behavior. Anything that's not part of the, so to speak, public API, because like behavior can be defined not only on user interface, but also like on the level of API. And uh, whenever we specify behavior, like we should focus on what, not how. I will show you some more examples later. So this puts the first uh, bullet point on our list how to do BDD. It's name the expected behavior, so something that is visible on the outside. We don't want to you know, go into, think about it like a black box metaphor. Like we're not interested what's inside, but we're more interested what's visible on the output. Uh, yeah, so going to Gherkin, so like I said, this language is a bit tricky because it has two purposes. One of them is that humans should be able to read it, and this will be the main goal, we'll be focusing on that mostly. And the second is it should be parsable by computers, and as a result, we get something we call executable specification. So we can read it, it feels natural. I mean, I'm not a, a native language, uh, native English speaker, so for me it's not that awkward, but I suppose that for them it might be a bit. But it's a trade-off. Uh, nonetheless, if nobody gonna read the BDD specs you write, that kind of defeats the purpose of having them. Maybe you need another approach. So if we compare like these two scenarios, it's, it's simple that one of them is more readable than the other. Uh, I uh, won't tell you which one, I guess you already know that. Uh, the second one on your right uh, is actually has more problems with it, but I will get to them in a second. Yeah, so we want our scenarios to be nice, sweet, like the one on the left side that could be grasped, you know, uh, without much effort, because otherwise, again, it defeats the purpose because nobody would gonna read them. Uh, yeah, so, but before we gonna jump into details how to write such specs, uh, let's talk about development process in particular. So, maybe let's start from uh, recipes that actually work. So, it's very nice if we can do it in a collaborative way. So, there is a lightweight workshop called Free Amigos, when we have, for example, software developer, a tester, and a project manager or someone else from business or a stakeholder, and we work on them together on these examples, maybe using auxiliary techniques like example mapping and so on and so forth. But uh, the bottom line is that we don't do it solo. And uh, another stuff that can work is pairing, for example, software developer working on a task and pairing with tester to help them work on the uh, BDD scenarios. And uh, if, for example, your stakeholders, your business is not right, uh, available right to you, you can also review with them those specs later. Uh, that should also be fine because they will know we agree or disagree with you, you could improve, and so on. And why do we do that? In a second. What definitely doesn't work is, for example, testers or QA departments working separately. And, you know, they are the only ones responsible for maintaining those. Nobody's reviewing that. That's not going to work. Uh, because they will just slide away from the system and, for example, developers don't have any incentive to, you know, make it life easier for the testers. And uh, the same, on the same mm, note, business analysts, for example, working uh, before the team and just handing them out these scenarios also wouldn't work that much because, well, they have their understanding but they may fail to convey just everything to, to the software developer. And now, 
This is because the main goal of BDD, and if there is only one thing that you take out from this presentation, let it be it. The goal is to building shared understanding between stakeholders and developers. Or for another note, any person that works or interacts with the system. Uh, if we lose uh, that shared understanding, we actually have a pretty big problem because there appears a gap between uh, how people working on the system or how the system actually works and how I know business stakeholders or project managers think it works. So other symptoms are uh, something should take uh, little time according to project managers, but actually it takes months. That's because this gap occurs. So when this happens, uh, you don't need BDD, you actually need this one. Um, yeah, or uh, work hard on building that shared understanding. This is sometimes also called ubiquitous language, meaning omnipresent language. That means that we all are on the same page, we use the same names, you know, they are present in code, in specs, and in day-to-day -day conversations. So that's the actual goal of BDD. And about Gherkin, uh, Gherkin writing, the first piece of advice I can give you is to, you know, use realistic common scenarios. It's also worthy to test for some edge cases, but you know, don't exaggerate. Uh, maybe it's not the best uh, way to put them into BDD specs. Uh, actually, I worked uh, with a pretty smart guy, Chris, uh, in some time, and once he got his hands on BDD stuff, he went, whoa, I can now automate away all my manual work of testing. And, but the result was that he wrote a lot of tests that you know, took time to run, but brought no benefit, actually. So we deleted some of them, and also testers like do have uh, the appropriate skills to do so, because like when I approach him and ask, hey, Chris, but when you are testing the system for regression before release, are you actually, you know, we're executing all these scenarios? No, of course not. I'm smarter than this. I'm choosing the ones I'm executing, yeah? So you should do the same with BDD, yeah? Because it takes effort and time to maintain and write those tests. Um, the other thing is to rather be specific in your Gherkin, avoid expre expressions like um, less than equal 10 or something like this, because if this is an executable specification, there is a word specific in a specification for a reason, like if someone reads that and doesn't quite get uh, how it exactly works, it also defeats the, the purpose. And last, but I guess the most uh, uh, important, which always get people into trouble when they start with BDD, it put in the spec only what matters. Because we're tempted to put a lot of uh, details as if we were writing code, but they are all, all many times not uh, relevant. So for example, uh, let's say we have two specs. The first one is for authentication based on username and password, and the second one is on the banning users. You kind of already seen this one. So in the first case, uh, when we spec the, uh, the behavior, uh, we use both username and password. These two pieces of information are relevant to understand the feature of authentication. But when we are specifying the banning users, we actually don't need the password to describe the behavior. It's like no irrelevant. Of course, we need to have some password between the hood, but we don't really have to put it in the spec because that's unnecessary. Mm. And what not to do? Uh, definitely don't write scripts in Gherkin. Uh, this is script, okay? This exactly like tells you what to do step by step, but it's hard to deduct how the system actually works. Yeah, so you rather be, you know, descriptive, declarative way, describe what the user can see, what they can do, what's possible, what's not, and not, you know, explain like a, uh, uh, like a robot what to do step by step, because it's not really, Helpful. So whenever you're tempted to do so, just don't. Mm, because you are describing the feature using behavior and not trying to tell step by step what happens. So other piece of advice, don't get lost in UI details. Whether automating PDD on UI is a good idea, it's a bit different topic. We'll get to it in a second. And also don't try to make individual Gherkin steps, generic and reusable as possible. So that's the case with this username and password. If you have a step already that says there's a user registered with uh, username and this password, and in other scenario like with this banning, you don't need this password bit, just do another step. You, you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, be careful about a large number of them. Uh, the goal is readability. Uh, 
also uh, about reusing. Uh, so there, there was or there is still a feature in behave library that lets you execute steps like by just, you know, entering the string. And you just name those steps and the behave will execute them. So back when I see it uh, working with Chris, the same guy, we thought this was a pretty good idea. But the reality is that Gherkin is not meant to be reusable. So this was pretty dumb. Uh, we got a lot of issues uh, connected with maintainability about it because, for example, uh, when you have Gherkin uh, and, for example, you use PyCharm, it has an integration that lets you jump uh, from the definition uh, of the steps to the Gherkin files and so and uh, in two ways. And in this case, it's not even supported. So whenever we change something, a lot of tests that were doing execute steps crashed. So also, like, don't try to reuse Gherkin because it's not the way how it was meant to be. Uh, so this puts a second point on our uh, list, how to do BDD. Uh, once we know the behavior which is expected, we need to capture it using Gherkin. And it's best to work it collaboratively, at least show it to other person to tell them what they think, if they understand it the same way we do, uh, because it's meant to be read later. And if someone tries to read it but doesn't get the information, then what was the point of this entire exercise? And we want to make specs short and simple, specific to the point. So you might have an impression that the piece of advice so far was to basically keep it simple and everything will be OK. But getting to simple is not easy, especially if the system you have under the hood is complex. So you know we can describe it simply, but that complexity is there somewhere lurking. So that's how we like need to manage. Uh, like out of my experience, uh, one guy I talked to on one training was said that, okay, yeah, we tried BDD, but quickly those uh, scenarios become too long and too hard to maintain. Yes, exactly, because like you perhaps lacked some tools or your architecture weren't supporting it. So I will now show you, uh, uh, show you some examples and how to actually uh, make them simple from, from complex to simple. Um, so let's say like we're building this software as a service platform for subscriptions. And within that, we can like identify different clusters of features. So for example, we have something about user success management, this registration, password reminders, and so on. Plans management, when you, for example, define what can be bought, like there is monthly plan that, mm, that is priced $10 and there is annual plan that sprites uh, $100 and what, what benefits they bring and so on. Then you have subscriptions, which actually control, let you subscribe to concrete plans and payments. And uh, we could pretty much go on, like, you know, identify those sub areas uh, until we like get bored or, uh, or, uh, or tired. Uh, but it's very important to do so uh, from a standpoint of another technique called domain-driven design, which means first look at the problem, the entirety of it, all the sub-problems you have, and then use this information to make decisions about modularity, the scope of your tests, and so on. You will see examples in a second. So in domain-driven design, these sub-areas are called subdomains. And the entirety of the knowledge that, for example, is required to work on this project or the company that's solving the problem is called domain. But that's, that's just extra. We're, let's go back to, to the BDD. So if we want to make our BDD simple, we need to limit their scope. And only if we can you know, distinguish different areas, we are able to do so. And this is like a general piece of advice for designing systems. Like, if you want you know, to make them simpler and manageable, you need to limit the amount of information. And there is a lots and lots of problems that you get rid of when you get the modularization of the system, of the system right. So if writing BDDs or testing in general hurts, it's not easy, it's difficult, then perhaps your architecture is to blame. Because in Python, you know, we can go to the great lengths, we can uh, monkey patch everything we want to, but maybe uh, the effort should be put elsewhere. So going back to our system, like let's assume like we have these four areas of features or subdomains. So users management, plans management, subscriptions and payments. And we have a following scenario, which will be using all of them. And I'm doing this on purpose because we will uh, shortly, uh, um, shortly split it into smaller manageable pieces. 
So it starts with a user registered with username foo. Okay, there's no password. That's some progress. Uh, then let's assume we have a plan called monthly that has a specific price and has a specific benefits. And whenever user subscribes to this monthly plan, uh, they should be subscribed to that plan. They should be charged in $10 minus than one cent. And they should have fast support in their benefits. And the user's next build date should be a month for now. So this is pretty huge, and when I say small, nice uh, specs, I mean like, you know, three, four steps at maximum. So definitely something to work on, because we have like seven. But to simplify, like we need to first limit the scope, because it appears that we are trying to, you know, do everything at once in this one little spec. We, we're trying to describe all the behavior, and that may or may not be like um, manageable in the longer term. So. The first thing we can uh, actually uh, do uh, is to you know, decide which, thing, which things we need to focus on. So there are a lot of stuff intertwined here. So let's say I will make this scenario specifically about cash, about how much I pay, when's the next bill date, and so on. So I can you know, limit the amount of details. So first, a uh, little refactoring of this scenario I can do is I can move one of those uh, steps to the background. This is like uh, in a single feature. This will be reused across all scenarios. So of course, we always need something to subscribe to, but it's not you know, uh, important to be in this particular scenario because like doing nothing special about it. And actually, mm, we don't care about the benefits in itself because I only interested the focus I mentioned about uh, the price I pay. So we can get rid of one step and simplify the other one. So it's already better. Um, and then since focus is on the money, we can uh, omit the first then step. User should be subscribed to plan monthly. So uh, yeah, we get rid of uh, one step, one another step. So we add four. Um, and also, so this is uh, one approach to we uh, remove steps that are not necessary because like we simply decide not to check them at all and also like remove some details from other steps that may be necessary like this uh, background given plan uh, but like we don't care about benefits so we also like simplify the individual steps as it was with username and password for banning when we didn't care about password Mm, yeah, and another stuff, uh, we can make some things implicit because in such a system, there's always a user. Maybe I don't need to spec it. Uh, so I will just simply remove this uh, given user because I don't really need it. So in this case, uh, simplified means limiting number of details, either because I don't need them specifically or maybe because uh, like they're not relevant for this scenario. So this puts another point on our how to BDD. Once we have the expected behavior, we capture it using Gherkin, use some collaborative process, not to do it solo. We keep our specs short and simple. And afterward, like we need to think about architecture, the boundaries, so that our scenarios you know, are not too wide, not trying to test everything at once, because that's, that's not going to work in the longer term. Nobody's going to read it. And also, we have bad time updating it later. Uh, OK, but if we like make the Gherkin simple, so it's easy to digest, easy to read, uh, and the underlying system is still complex, uh, we just shifted the problem elsewhere, right? So, okay, there are no more dragons in Gherkin, but they do live somewhere, right? Yes, of course, and this will be called the automation layer, or simply saying all the code that's just after this, this step. So then, in this place, we'll focus on making the solution maintainable, uh, code the duplicated and so on. Uh, but before we jump into implementation, uh, let's first talk about uh, which layer should we use to implement our BDD specs on. So what I see in examples over and over again is to starting with UI, maybe with Selenium or some similar solution. I don't think that's a, a right approach in most cases, especially when single page applications, you know, exploded, kind of became very popular. Uh, for example, when I open Facebook on my computer, on my profile, it sends 140 HTTP requests to the background. And uh, I assume that at least half of them actually does something, apart from tracking me, of course. But it also means that, you know, probably they read some data from the database, maybe some do some calculations and so on, and I need to set up my system for that. So in general, 
user interface will have more dependencies, which means more setup, slower tests, hard to maintain, and so on. So out of experience, like I learned, API level should be considered first to automate BDD on. But of course, if it makes sense in your case, you can go up and down. Um, it's just my default, yeah, I start with API. So let's now do some coding, right? Because I was showing you Gherkin, you are on the Python conference, I'm also a Python developer, so where's Meet, so to speak? Where's, uh, where's actual code? So let's automate this scenario that we simplified. So a user subscribes to monthly plan. Um, the first thing we do, uh, like if we do it on the API, like we're gonna have a lot of HTTP requests using test clients of our framework, for example, FastAPI in this case, and we'll be sending various requests. And uh, like the first thing we do to make this code like more manageable uh, is to abstract away the protocol. So like we can uh, simply grab all those distinct requests, distinct uh, methods of uh, different um, endpoints, and uh, move them to another class, or maybe a bunch of functions in the module works the same way, uh, which we'll call app client, and this will just, you know, uh, accept some attributes, but we no longer have to, you know, write the entire query. Uh, this may not be a big issue for HTTP, because it's pretty concise protocol, but once in a day I worked with GraphQL, that was also used as the main uh, API, and it was uh, really hard for us to test to, to manage this because built-in GraphQL query requires a bit more, uh, a bit more, uh, more lines of code. Uh, it's harder to format and so on, parameterize. So it was uh, much better when we introduced such such a pattern. And of course, we pack it into some PyTest fixture like PyTest BDD is uh, the library I use in this presentation. And uh, eventually, like our step definition looks like this. So it's much simpler and much easier. So the first, uh, the first pattern we can use is app client to just abstract away the protocol. We actually name the uh, methods with the actions that we can do on the system. So then, uh, you know, our steps can be, can be mu much, much smaller. Um, but when we are dealing with API, we're usually making requests on behalf of some user. And like I said, I decided to make you make this implicit so the tests don't uh, you know, explicitly name which user they uh, will be calling requests on uh, behalf on. And uh, with HTTP and, for example, standard methods like uh, authorization bearer token, uh, this is pretty simple because we make simply parameterize our app client you know, to keep this user token as another fixture and keep it inside and just reuse it. So whenever like we make a request using app client, we then you know don't, don't have to deal explicitly with the authentication or whom uh, who sends the request because it's part of app client. And for example, if we have like a test scenario that needs a few users, then we can have a few app clients each for uh, separate for each user. And now about this user token. Of course, we can uh, make it the hard way, the usual way, like register the user, uh, then log in, then grab the token, and you know, uh, return it from the fixture. But in many systems that are, for example, using microservices are correctly decoupled, what we actually need is a token. Maybe sometimes the user doesn't have to exist. Uh, and in these cases, uh, it may be very handy to you know, just do the shortcut and generate the token the other way. Um, we used uh, a similar uh, approach to our test that we're using Selenium on the UI. So in every test, you have to go through the login, right? No, you don't. You just need a cookie that's valid. So instead of logging over and over again in our scenarios, uh, we just generated the cookie and you know added it to to subsequent um, yeah to subsequent requests. Right. So to recap, uh, we have our Gherkin that you know is optimized for readability for humans. Then we have the steps definition in code, and one of the design patterns we can use is a client that you know, we abstract away the protocol used. Uh, and in our case, app clients will be always associated with some user credentials, because like all requests are done on behalf of some user. Uh, OK, so let's now focus on the second step. User should be charged uh, something dollars. And 
it's natural that we will like be no in, and will not be implementing like our integration with bank and payment systems, but we'll use something you know off the shelf that's ready to use like Stripe or Adyen or whatever. And what I often see, uh, and I perceive it as a regrettable practice, is that we go like straight away to like uh, monkey patching the client li library. Don't do this. This is wrong. This is very wrong. First of all, there is a general piece of advice for testing. Don't mock what you don't own. And what it means, don't simply mock the code you haven't write or you have no control on to, of. Because uh, whenever, for example, you upgrade the library and you didn't quite catch the uh, subtle change, you will simply fail to, to notice it. Yeah, so you mocked one behavior but by the library, for example, can behave a different way. Also, uh, for example, Adyen requires quite a lot of arguments to call, so why you know, burden and uh, put a mess in your tests when you can make it a bit simpler? And the second reason is that concrete payment provider actually belongs to you know, the payments, not the subscriptions. So therefore, it could be hidden from the outside world, and we don't have to you know, put this information in BDD especially. And what we can do with that, we can use another design pattern called facade, and like for each of our modules, like user management, payments, um, subscriptions, and plans management, like we can have facades that will you know, expose the API in a form of a single class. That's, of course, one of the ways. So we'll, for example, have method like create recurring payment, and it can, of course, use Adyen inside, but in BDD tests, like we don't have to you know, go that down to, to actually make sure that, uh, that that this will happen. Uh, speaking of uh, type hinting and type checkers, uh, of course we need those to actually ensure that this will be working later. And facet does have to be a class, obviously. Uh, it can be just a bunch of functions or a bunch of classes. You know, the point is to just have a one entry point to any given module or component of your application. So, like, you know, you, you know where to stop uh, when you, for example, implement BDD. Mm, and then, since we have our facet, which we said it's an API, so by definition will be more stable and also owned by you, uh, then we can re resort to using our standard monkey patching. And for example, assert that um, in the exact amount of money expected has been, has been charged. Mm, and last but not least, uh, there is also a step with uh, monthly plan. So, of course, we could naturally use uh, plans facet inside our tests to just create the plan and store it in the database so that it will be checked later. Uh, but we can also uh, just mock the method that will be used by subscriptions, in this case, get plan. So, we limit the scope of the BDD by, you know, the actual pay plans is not, uh, not exercised here. We only like will be have mocked this get plan part. Uh, and regarding the implementation, uh, it's pretty pretty nicer right now because like we uh, have this mock on a stable interface. Uh, but there's one thing I still don't like. I deliberately you know removed the benefits part from the BDD spec because I said it wasn't relevant. So why the heck do I have to repeat, uh, uh, put it into the step definition? Uh, turns out I don't really have to. And for that, uh, mm, okay, sorry. Uh, and for that purpose, like we can use, for example, Factory Boy, or just you know, write a custom function with default arguments. So like we have something called sensible defaults. So you know, in general case, uh, we can have, uh, like, for example, a plan without benefits because maybe they are optional, maybe we manage it other way. And close, we are close to the end of the presentation, and after that I put the last, the final point on how to BDD. Uh, you can't really do BDD in any non-trivial system that lacks modularization. You need to take care about, you know, architecture first, and then to make you know, code reusable, maintainable, use various patterns in automation layers such as app clients, uh, such as facades and so on. So that will, be, that will be simplest. And factories, of course, too. So apart from uh, the most important uh, takeaway from you, that goal of BDD is not testing, but rather building shared understanding, 
is that to verify behavior. This is also a good piece of advice in general for tests. Yeah? Testing on implementation details like makes your code difficult to refactor later. When you verify behavior, I mean you're closer to it, of course, not, not always on the UI, uh, then it will be just easier for you to later evolve. And also sometimes you like, don't have to write that many tests because maybe two uh, scenarios you know, uh, on the top level will be enough to cover everything. Uh, yeah, and I can't stress this enough, building shared understanding is really the point of the uh, BDD. Uh, it's not tests, uh, it's not writing Gherkin in itself, it's to build shared understanding, which also means when that understanding changes, because for example some new requirements uh, come, maybe you hire another expert, then uh, says you it's all wrong, should be done differently, then you also need to be able to you know, refactor those specs and yeah. And that's not something you write once and forget about it. It should you know, evolve along with your uh, understanding. And regarding further reading, if you are more interested in the topic, um, the first position I recommend the most, it's a specification by example book by Goiko Ajit, I think. Uh, that's how it's pronounced, and it's uh, like uh, it has been a gold mine. Uh, it's pretty uh, exhaustive because it has uh, three or four uh, case studies of actual companies. So there's a lot of knowledge in there, a lot of practical knowledge, a lot to choose from. Uh, the second one is BD in action. You can read optionally, and there are also like two uh, next uh, articles which are very helpful. Whose domain is it anyway? Uh, is from the author of BDD, and it explicitly says about the problem when we try to put, you know, too many things at once in a single BDD spec. So then it's a second read, uh, recommended from my side. And if you, well, I'm not uh, making BDD uh, explicitly, but you would just like some general advice on unit testing, then you can start from this blog post, People Behavior and Unit Testing by Vladimir Korikov, and I recommend also other posts on his site. Yeah, and that will be it. Thank you for bearing with me. Hey, uh, thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, I have one question on the, uh, the example that you showed um, with uh, uh, with a monthly subscription plan. So I was looking at what do what what is implicit, what is explicit, and it seemed to me that the monthly plan had an implicit 30-day expiration uh, in the in the Gherkin. Was that intentional, or is that because if we look at the Gherkin, it never says like uh, monthly is 30 days? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a very good question. So uh, yeah, this is a simplification, really. Uh, this shouldn't be hidden, especially, I mean, for this scenario, um, yeah, when, okay, wh when we look at the last step, the next yes. build date, this should be made explicit right. in this okay, case, okay. yeah, sure. uh, definitely. Okay, thanks. Hey, uh, great talk, first of all. Um, I would like to ask, do you have any tips for dealing with eventual consistency on mm -hmm. the system that's yeah. underneath? So this is a very general question about uh, eventual consistency. So uh, like usually we start from, um, from explicit weights done in a, in a loop. So like, for example, we know that, for example, some endpoint will start returning a different answer, but you know, I don't know when, yeah? Eventual consistency, right? So we keep on polling it, meaning querying repeatedly in, with some small um, intervals like, uh, 50 milliseconds or so, the first approach, yeah. But the, if you have any specific case in mind, maybe you could elaborate a bit? No, it just, it seems like, like on, on this level, it seems like everything happens instantly. Yeah. And is that a problem to deal on the uh, spec level or no. rather the optimization level? Uh, okay, so that depends as always. So, in ge but in general, uh, I, I'm not you know dodging the question. Uh, we are generally doing this on automation level, yeah, uh, layer. We like do these uh, loops with weights, and we have some timeout, and then we. But if we like were to use Gherk, you know, to specifically uh, specify you know this eventual consistency, then you know we would put it, yeah. But then you know it's. 
I, I still find it hard to imagine, for example, you know, I would specify that this message like comes in less than five seconds and <laughs> yeah. Okay. Kinda seems awkward then, yeah? So I would deal it on an automation layer. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, really excited to dive in. Uh, I have a similar feeling when I first started using TDD to kind of not just test the units, but to inform how I design a function. It seems like BDD is really nice for informing the design of your service layer. My question is, was the reason that we're dealing with the API uh, client was because this was a microservices thing? If I'm not dealing with microservices, can I just use the service layer? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Abs absolutely you can. You know, I just, uh, I'll tell you why, why that's my approach. So even if we like have a smaller, not large monolith, but a smaller one that's still manageable, I would still do it on the API because simply uh, I can easy, more easy get 100% code coverage that way. Yeah? Because if I you know, do it on the service layer, which is perfectly reasonable, uh, I still have to you know, somehow cover these uh, views. Yeah? Okay. And you know, they don't uh, slow test that much and you know, I kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. Sure, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. So I have a question of how generally applicable do you think BDD is? Because I always see it in the context of, you know, uh, websites, other API scenarios. But uh, let's say I have a data pipeline which like runs on a batch job, which every midnight mm -hmm. extracts some data from the database, transforms it, loads into a different database, and then there is mm -hmm. another user which consumes the results, and we need to have a shared understanding with okay. him. Would you say BDD is a good uh, uh, tool for this to agree on a specification, or would you advise to use something more formal here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the question is about limits of application BDD. So in your case, I would rather uh, not choose BDD per se, because I feel, and like the team I'm currently working with also learned the hard way that perhaps uh, putting technical details in Gherkin is a bit awkward, it doesn't really help much, yes? So we just decided, you know, to that part, we just use usual PyTest and just write it very technically, because that better worked for us. And the other part uh, of your question, which you didn't ask uh, explicitly, uh, is about data-driven systems. Yes, because uh, I'm working mostly with product companies, and I deliberately choose them because I like it. And the, in this area, BDD works better. But what if you have more like data-driven? I cannot answer that, uh, but uh, Goiko Ajik in his book Specification by Example has some case studies about that explicitly. Yeah, so if any one of you works with more a data-driven approach, I'm not no expert on that, but yeah, Goiko is. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. I have a second question, but... Uh, okay, um, I would like to know, uh, what do you think about BDD as a part of a concept of uh, test as living documentation? Uh, I think it's a pretty uh, utopian idea. We, I, you know, I'm pretty disappointed by, you know, not many like successful products or, you know, uh, consultancies built around the idea. You know, there are only few. So I really like the idea. I'm actually, let's say, experimenting to make it happen. But the big uh, blocker, for example, is you know, to make these uh, specs accessible to people that are not necessarily writing code. So for example, one person uh, that's not writing code uh, in my team goes to you know, Git and can read them. But I guess you know, for other people, uh, this is you know, a barrier not impossible to cross, yeah. So yeah, I, I really, I admire the idea. I'm really surprised by lack of, I, the lack of success stories in the field. And, don't understand it at the moment. Maybe you know something I don't know. Okay, but I will try anyway. So uh, I work with AI and the last six months have been crazy. And when uh, looking at these uh, uh, GPT and language model capabilities, my first uh, instinct was whether it is possible to use uh, automatic generation, either for turning natural language into Gherkin or for turning uh, for basically writing Gherkin steps automatically with things like Copilot because it requires only like limited context window. Uh, have you tried it or have you heard about anyone trying that? Uh, yep, so uh, I can say you that, uh, for example, um, Copilot is pretty bad and uh, suggesting Gherkin. 
Uh, actually, the, this bad, I, bad, bad example that I saw you, you know, which is a script, was generated by Copilot. But, uh, but Copilot, okay, oh, I don't have this open any, any, anymore. Because there is also this closed beta of uh, Copilot X, which, you know, ships for um, uh, Visual Studio Code Insiders, which is a early build. And I asked it to, you know, provide some examples and it were better. Yeah, so perhaps uh, if they put some more attention into it, it may be, may be better, yeah? yeah? Awesome, thank you. Right, so first thing first, uh, thank you for the talk today. Um, um, you argued against the use of uh, behavior-driven design on, on the, H, the, web, the UI level, but I mean, you left unsaid, or probably you just hinted about the idea of using BDD, BDD at the model level. Uh, would you argue for or against usability at that very internal layer? And if so, is there any mm -hmm. example that comes to mind? Okay, so uh, personally, I have like no objection because if I understand correctly, you're asking if I would be against using BDD like lower, yeah, on the model. I see no problem with that personally, but haven't done this. I think it might work. It should be should be good. Thank you again. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. Um, we are currently thinking about using BDD in our project, and I'm wondering whether we should use Behave or PyTest BDD. Uh, have, what are the features we should consider for our okay. decision? Right, so uh, I worked with Behave uh, 2018, I believe, and as far as I, as, I, uh, as I checked before this talk, they haven't released a new version since then, which is kind of... Interesting, but also we had a couple of issues with behave like it wasn't really running tests in parallel So the, I remember there was a match request uh, supposed to you know provide that feature. I don't know if it was merged so We're now with PyTest BDD and I'm really fond of it. You know, I think it makes the job It's not ideal because for example, it doesn't like support all the uh, new uh, new syntax of Gherkin, but uh, it's more than enough for us, so to speak. This 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 fork, PyTest BDD NG, which I noticed it was some update four months ago, and it has those features. So I would you know just run a comparison between those two. PyTest BDD, if you already have experience with PyTest, should be you know less uh, has you know uh, less steep learning curve. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. It was super interesting. Uh, I have a question around, um, you mentioned code coverage just before, but you also said that it's not really about you know, coverage. I wonder what success looks like and what are the cues that tell you that you have enough scenarios or that your tests are broad enough for mm. you to consider it a good code base or a healthy one? I don't think there is a clear <laughs> you know, a success scenario because the thing is, uh, you know, that uh, like with testing itself, yeah, we can have like code coverage on 100%, but it's only a metric of how many code actually we executed. With test scenarios in general, you can only write those that you know figure out to figure out or copilot, uh, you know, suggests. So that's it. Yeah, I wouldn't like you know uh, tell about. Uh, you, we can use another metric, but it's not uh, easy to calculate or enforce. Like, are people actually using it? And do they find it helpful? Yeah. So that, that's different. Yeah. For example, if the scenarios are not too big, yeah, that, that would be my success metric around it. Okay. But Thank really, you. really tough question. Thank you for this one. I'll be thinking about it all night. Yeah. So we'll thank everyone and thanks Sebastian for the talk. Uh, yeah.